episode of These Go to Eleven. Let's turn it up. Hey everybody, welcome back to These Go to Eleven, an unchurchy conversation about everyday faith. Please make sure you like, subscribe, and review on your favorite podcast platform. This not only helps us to get our content out there, but also helps us to find out what you, our faithful listeners, think. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to These Go to Eleven. Once again, I'm Nathan Bell. Joining me as always, Greg Dutcher. Greg, what's going on, man? I'm doing well, man. Uh, can you hear me okay? Because I hear you, but not through my headphones. I can hear you fine. And I can hear you fine. I can hear you All fine. Right. Let's just keep doing that. No, I can hear you fine. <laughs> no, I can hear you fine. Dude, tell me, <laughs> since the topic came up and we're not afraid of the random, did you ever do that stupid thing with like a girlfriend growing up where you hang up, you hang up, you hang up? I did not. But yeah, here's, me either. here's the reason why. Yeah. Um, I only dated one other girl before Joy. Wow. And uh, I dated her when I was in ninth grade. And yeah. I I am happy slash proud to say I was not that lame when I was in ninth grade. <laughs> I became more lame later in life. Yes. I will proudly say I was that lame. <laughs> I did do such things. And sometimes I look back, wow, Lord, thank you for not like striking me down for <laughs> such uh idiocy but yeah like oh no you got no i'm not gonna hang you hang up wow anyway just no, because we I, had that moment actually in fact um so uh we were, we were just talking about this but joy's family you know they lived in ethiopia for mm -hmm. a number of years and she would go and visit them on uh holidays during you know school breaks and things like that and, you know, back then was AOL chat. Oh, um, yeah. And so uh, I would actually fall asleep, no joke, chatting with her. Like we'd be just chatting back and forth. Wow. And I had this comfy chair, kind of like what you're sitting in now yep. at our computer uh, desk. And I would literally like fall asleep and I'd wake up, you know, like a half hour later and, you know, on the screen would just be like a string of like nonsense, <laughs> you know, letters enjoy, you know, her, her little uh, thing there. Uh, are you, did you fall asleep? Are you, okay, I guess you fell asleep. I'll That's talk to you so tomorrow. Funny. That's so funny. Is that, was that, that was AOL Instant Messenger. That was AIM. Instant, yep. AIM. I remember that, dude. Yep. I remember that. The early days of the internet. I had, uh, I think my first email was Juno. Do you remember that? Yep. And yep. remember, you'd hear the... Yep. Yep. It would say handshaking. Yep. It would take forever to establish the yep. connection. And when you first went to websites, do you remember it would like pixelate? Yes. From top to bottom row by yep. painful row? Yep. Dude, are we that old? We we are. Yeah, uh, I'm older than you. I know. Wow. I know, but not by much. I mean, that's no. the thing. Like we're we're old enough within the same generational yes. pattern that yes. I, I remember the upcoming computers and all it's of that crazy. stuff. It's crazy. Sometimes, dude, I think because I realize my kids have always known it, and when I teach college students, like recently, uh, when I was at Towson, it was interesting. Two uh, young ladies in the front got there a little early and they were just chit-chatting very very uh very nice kids and they were just asking me oh professor when you were here at Towson because you know I always say I was there a million years ago sure. 32 years ago that I I graduated um oh yeah I tell them oh the whole liberal arts building that he wasn't here right uh obviously no Starbucks in the library uh all the English courses were in Linthicum that building's being torn down now and and they were just fascinated they were asking me questions that I realized they had no framework to understand. I know. Like, they were I like, know. so how did, but how did you know where to go? I said, well, there's this weird thing that usually exists called paper. Right. <laughs> and they would send you a thick packet yeah. of paper. And I said, and you, you often knew if you were accepted or rejected by a college just by the thickness of the envelope. Yeah. If yep. you had a thin envelope, it was probably just one page to tell you, we regret to inform you. If you had a whole stack, it was other stuff. So they couldn't believe 
Well, how did, so I said, yeah, they would say your orientation is on this date. Here's a phone number you could call for more info. You need to, to show up on campus and register for your parking pass. And yeah, I said, you never thought anything of it. Just yeah. What you did. And they couldn't believe it. Uh, we, uh, Joy is a big fan of NCIS. Oh, yeah. And we were just watching an episode recently where, all of their smart devices got hacked. Yeah. And so they had no way, you know, no way to basically, you know, locate something, you know. So one of the the people's talking and they're like, oh yeah, just drop me a pin to that location. Yeah. And they're like, I can't do that. You don't have your phone. And he's like, how am I supposed to get there? And you know, Gibbs, <laughs> you know, Gibbs. And he's like, get a map. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, what, what a map. <laughs> What is that? Dude, it's scary when map quest is considered old school. I know. That was cutting edge at the time. Right. Remember, you, you'd map it out. You'd pre-print. Print the directions. Your directions. Yep. I mean, you, 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 nobody ever thinks about it anymore. Yeah, it is fascinating, dude, that we, we do have the, uh, I guess, unique place in life uh, in, in our generation to say we remember yeah. in, in Stephen King's Dark Tower series. Uh, kind of a fantasy epic in 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 another world. Um, the phrase there is uh, they they refer to things in the present as whatever, but in the past as that was before the world turned. Mm. And I honestly do, do feel like it's been such an epic shift. Yeah, you know that the first essentially twenty plus years of my life, almost thirty. Uh, we're lived in one reality, right? Then you saw it morph and shift, and it's we're, we're never going back, dude. No, unless we have a good old zombie apocalypse or an EMP. An EMP? It's a, hey, an EMP that knocked things out for a year. I would just like to see how people get by, right? Yeah, of course I act like I'm all self reliant. <laughs> I'd be the first person sniveling about not getting my my Orioles <laughs> updates. <laughs> Um, what do you mean I can't order ahead, Duncan? <laughs> no, come on. I've got points on my Starbucks app. I've got to use That's so true, dude. Um, I used to have a, uh, a former uh, boss of mine who, who would contemplate those things. He's like, do you know what we, you would do if anything like that ever happened? And I'm like, yeah, that was literally my <laughs> college degree. Like, I grew up in New Hampshire. I lived that. Like, yeah. what are you talking? He's like. If we ever run into that situation, I'm finding you. Yes. It's bad, dude, if people think of us as the rugged survivalist. We're right. like, uh, we can do it, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm amazed sometimes, Nathan, how much I just rely for all my worlds, church, grad school, teaching, the technology. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm all in. I, I rely on it literally every single day. Yeah. Every, anything you upload, anything you download, I always rely on it um but i got through college mm -hmm. and seminary never had a computer yeah there in seminary i was in seminary 93 to 97 okay so there were some students i remember with these huge thick yeah yeah, yeah. like five inch thick laptops yeah. right yep. that were clanking the away they were just those big bricks and they'd bring them into class plug them in or whatever and I remember thinking, what is that? I had an electronic typewriter. Um, nice. That was my, my cutting edge uh, device and never thought anything of it. And when we wrote Greek and Hebrew papers, I was telling this to Ryle, uh, one of our elders who's uh, in his retirement years, mm -hmm. is doing seminary, which is really cool. And I told him, I said, Ryle, you know, when I was in it and I took Greek and Hebrew, you had to type and leave space to go back and write the Greek or Hebrew words by hand. Yeah. That's just how you did it. Anyway, enough down memory lane. That's right. Anybody listening that's young is like, would these old guys stop droning? <laughs> and then back in my day when I should get off my lawn, I'd walk up to you know five miles to school and back uphill both ways. In the snow. In the snow. And uh, then I'd come home and I'd, uh, I'd feed the chickens. <laughs> all right. That's all I got. More uh, important things to talk more about. More important things. Well, we are uh still in March at this point, and this is we're we're actually in Holy Week right now. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we just celebrated Palm Sunday. Uh we are heading into uh Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and of course, uh you know, Resurrection Sunday. And so, Greg, we thought we would go ahead and pivot. We had been looking at Exodus and how um, Exodus is really 
a milestone in the the Hebrew culture, is a milestone for the Jewish culture, and really is is a starting point for us as believers Mm -hmm. and how God is just showing his people through the Exodus, something that he's ultimately going to fulfill as you put it a couple weeks ago on a cosmic scale. Yeah. Um, Not just the deliverance of, of one little small nation, but of, of, generations of people from past, present, and future. Yeah. That is what the cross will ultimately represent. Yeah. Um, and so for uh, Holy Week, we are going to be looking at the significance of the Garden of Gethsemane, but also um, the six sayings of Christ on the cross. We're going to kind of... Seven sayings. Seven sayings. Yeah. Um, I caught that last week at the yeah, very yeah. end. Although, I'll put in something really quick for one of our faithful listeners, and you know who I'm talking about, my friend. One of those sayings is debated. Okay. Uh, I actually think it's likely legitimate, but we can cover that. Okay. We can cover that. So, in a sense, there are some people that say there were only six, six. legitimate. The one, I'll, I'll take away the suspense, is the some ancient texts do not have, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Talk about that when we get there. Um, so... Yeah, Greg, we we left off with um, Christ infusing new meaning into the Passover meal that he is sharing with his disciples, what we now celebrate and call communion. And so we leave that that meal, Mm -hmm. and Christ takes uh, his disciples, minus uh, Judas, who is going to betray him, to the garden, and he has... Uh, most of them remain on the outskirts, and then he takes three of them yeah. in a little bit further. Yeah. And then he himself goes in even further. Yeah. Talk to us about what's going on here and, and what Christ is doing ultimately. Yeah, it's fascinating to me, uh, the, the post-prayer time in the garden uh, a lot of commentators have pointed this out. It even actually came out when the Passion movie came out. I think I saw Gibson talking about this in an interview. That was, you believe it, that was 20 years ago. The 2004 yeah. movie came out. Um, I remember seeing that in theaters. Me too. I, I saw it yeah. at, the, at the Senator Theater. Okay. And yeah. it's the one movie that I, I'm not judging others that did it. Dude, I just could not get like junk food, popcorn. Yeah. For that movie, yeah, it was. There were, yeah, there were people that did. I yeah. remember. I just, you just felt uh, a little, yeah, felt weird. I, yeah, you know? I hear what you're it's saying. Not, not it, for me. I just felt. I don't know how to spec. It wasn't as much of a of a entertainment no. type movie. It would be like doing that with a documentary or something. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah, it would be weird doing that if you saw documentary footage of the Normandy invasion. Yeah, and it, it it's it's tough. But one of the things that stands out is, and I think this is often forgotten, is that Jesus had good cover. Mm. He knows that the temple guard, because of Judas's betrayal, is on their way to arrest him. Um, and once that happens, it's just automatic. Yeah. You know, everything is going to play out by script. So it's interesting that the environment for his final, what we might call prayer of wrestling mm-hmm. with his father, is in an environment it would have been incredibly easy for him to escape. Mm. Um, there was no way in the darkness, if he had a head start, that you're likely going to find this peasant who wants to be hidden and get out. So he's staying put. I think that's actually part of it. I think mm. some of the temptation is probably like spatially, geographically Mm -hmm. related. Um, So he's staying put. Peter, James, and John are the three that come a little further into the the garden with him. And it's just interesting. I mean, Gethsemane literally means it's like olive press, uh, which is just interesting imagery for what's what's going on. Mm. And here he is on the ground, of course, Luke tells us that he sweat uh, great drops of blood. Mm-hmm. We've talked about that in some other podcasts. Yeah. There is a condition called hematidrosis. Mm-hmm. It's been documented because um, some people think, well, it's a figure of speech. 
uh, maybe, but it doesn't have to be. Right. There is a condition where capillaries burst. Um, Close and, to the surface where the sweat and blood exactly. mix. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and they basically mix with the perspiration, ooze through the sweat glands, and you're sweating blood. It's, yeah. it's, it's a documented condition under times of extreme duress. Yeah. So just think about that. What fascinates me about it, Nathan, is that Jesus also seems to crave the companionship of his friends. Mm. And I think that's legit. Yeah. He wants his friends near him. Won't you stay awake and pray? Yeah. So he wants to talk to his father, but he wants them nearby. Yeah. And there they've you know, they've had a long day, they've had yeah. a big meal, they've had wine. And they can't stay away. Yeah. I mean, it's, and in fairness, it's late into it's the very evening. Late. Yeah. And they're nodding off. And, well, dude, you started by saying you're texting Joy yeah. in another yeah. lifetime on AOL. Yeah. And, you know, eventually your, your fingers probably slide and you drift and yeah. you're gone. And um, we know that feeling, right? Yeah. Staying awake. But Jesus is telling them to stay awake. And here he is on the ground praying. And I just am, am so taken by it, Nathan. The Father, is it possible to remove this cup from me? And that cup is a clear symbol. And I meant to have some of these uh, on here, dude. So I'm going to find this quickly. Um, well, while, while you're doing that, I think one of the things that we've mentioned before, um, you know, obviously... Uh, talking about the passion, you know, Gibson's portrayal of, um, you know, what Christ went through. Very, uh, very accurate, um, very accurate to particularly, um, you know, Catholic tradition. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I find fascinating, and I, I don't think this in any way takes away from it, is that portrayal of Satan in the garden with him, mm -hmm. um, I just, that whole scene, I, I find cinematically so profound. Mm -hmm. And also, that's something that you can visually imagine going on. And, it was a brilliant, and, you know, just, brilliant. just that back and forth where Satan is whispering into the ear of Christ, right? And Christ's focus is still just on his father. Yes. And then his resolve at the end, crushing the head of that snake yeah. that's going through. Um, just such a beautiful picture. I show that to my students every year yeah. um, because it is just such a, a beautiful picture of what Christ is resolving and setting himself to do. Oh, dude, I, let's talk about that since you brought it up. Yeah, that depiction. Yes, I'll be the first to say, no, we don't have that described in right. Scripture. So it's a an artistic choice. Yeah. It's a cinematic choice. And I'll argue, and I know you agree because we've talked about yeah. this, but the right one. Yes. Um, if you don't have that scene in The Passion of the Christ, you have a really well done depiction mm -hmm. of the final 12 hours of Jesus, particularly the scourging, which a lot of people, I don't think, realize. Um Jesus was submitted to before the crucifixion. Right. That is portrayed very graphically yeah. in the movie. It's it's a hard scene to watch. Um, obviously, how he was mocked by the soldiers. He was bounced from ruler to ruler. I mean, he had six trials total, three, Jew, three Jewish, three Roman. Mm -hmm. uh, they violated a bunch of their own laws. That's, that's a whole other thing. But you would have a depiction without the meaning. Yes. Um, that scene at the beginning is brilliant because it shows Jesus in Gethsemane. It's the prayer is there. You'll hear him, Abba, Abba, yeah. Adonai. It, it is he's asking, and it's translated for us because the whole movie is in Arabic. Aramaic. I, I mean Aramaic. Yeah. Um, and it's it's translated for us in subtitles. You know, is it possible to remove this cup? But you've got Satan there mm -hmm. in in the scene who is tempting him, mm -hmm. which portrays what Jesus is wrestling with. I always heard this, uh, somebody say this years ago, God doesn't tempt, he does test. Yeah. Satan tempts. And often it's it's the same event, it's the same incident, right? Yeah. I mean, you could say a, a man who's 
tempted by evil to be unfaithful to his wife also has a moment to be tested to see if the metal of his faith and trust in God's promises and his commands will hold. Yeah. That is similar to what's going on here. And because Satan says things like this in, in that scene in the movie, you can't do this. Right. This is, it's too costly. It's too much for one man to bear the sins of the world. Yeah. Now you know, that's the exposition the viewer needs to understand everything else. Right. Oh, this is what he's doing. Yes. This is his mission to bear our sins away. Yes. This is what he's going to do. So, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that scene, Nathan. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Yeah. Um, and you're right, cinematically it works. And he's just taking the symbolism from Genesis 3. Right. The proto-euangelion, which you talked about, the first announcement of the gospel. Yeah. Where um, that's the promise. That's the conflict. Right. Yeah, there's this epic conflict coming. Yep. And here we see it at the, at the events of Christ's death. Um, Christ is going to be seriously harmed. Yeah. And he certainly is. He's crucified. He dies, but he's going to crush the serpent. Yeah. So the fact that we find Jesus here, I mean, he knows it's coming. Yeah. And I think the key to the whole thing, and I did find it when you kindly gave me that introduction, Nathan. I mean, there's several passages but um, Jeremiah twenty five fifteen. 15, uh, thus the Lord, the God of Israel said to me, take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. Mm. Isaiah 51, 17, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord, the cup of his wrath, who have drunk um, to the dregs, the bowl, the cup of staggering. Um you see it again in uh, Revelation 14. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. Mm. Um, this symbol of the cup, that's what Jesus is wrestling with there in the garden. Yeah. Because I think John Stott wrote an article many, many years ago, 70s or 80s, called, Was Socrates Braver Than Jesus? Mm. Because when Socrates is faced with his, his trial, um, he, he grabs the hemlock and drinks it boldly. He tells his, his disciples, don't shed a tear. Mm -hmm. I'm taking the stand for the truth. So obviously Stott is going to argue, of course not. Right. Socrates is not braver than Jesus. But why is Jesus staggering here? Yeah. Socrates was considering the prospect of a quick death, an unpleasant one, um, but his own physical death. Jesus is looking, yeah, sure, at his death mm. in a very unpleasant one, right? Um, basically slow asphyxiation, but he's looking at something more. Yeah. And here's the heart of the whole story. Yeah. The wrath, the eternal fury of God's justice, punishment, of all sin. Yeah. And he looks it square in the eye and asks, Lord, is there any way I can save them? Yeah. And not drink this cup. It's the the cup is is hell itself. Yeah. It is the essence of of God's complete, if you want to use the fancy word, eschatological, his his final end times judgment on sin. And, dude, you and I or nobody, we just don't really know what that means. Yeah. But he did, and he staggers under the weight of it. Yeah. And it's just incredible yeah. that here he is. Is there any way I can save them? And um, it's not a sin to ask that question. Right. It's one final clarification. Yeah. And the answer is a non-answer. Yeah. Which is almost a little preview of what's coming. Yeah. The the, the dereliction, uh, we're going to get to the seven sayings. Yeah. But the cry of dereliction from the cross, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think those two go hand in hand. What, what he's anticipating in the garden, yeah. he's experiencing there. Yeah. So can I just stay on that a minute, dude? Yeah. 
I, I might be messing up the order here, but no. that fourth saying, yeah, because it's so connected. It, I'm, I, whenever I I read Jesus wrestling in the garden, and I see Jesus the the fourth cry mm-hmm. when he cries, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" Um, they just are just intricately connected. Yeah. Uh, I think the one is that moment in anticipation. Mm-hmm. The cry of dereliction on the cross is that moment in execution. Yeah. And we believe, based on those expressed truths, that God was purposely turning his back, yeah. forsaking Jesus yeah. in that moment because that's the price that had to be paid for right. sin. Well, and you, there, there's just so much. We, we've talked about the symmetry and symbolism of of God constantly bringing back to his people's minds and showing them, reminding them of the past, but showing them the way forward, yes. right? And we see that even here too, where, I mean, you think back to the temptations that Christ faces mm-hmm. at the beginning of his ministry, right? And, and what does Satan offer him even... Back then, you know, three, three, three and a half years ago, right? Showing him the kingdoms of the world. Yeah. Like, if you bow down to me, this can happen and you won't have to go through the cross, right? This is, right? All of these things are weighing on Christ. I think we've said it before. Uh, crucifixion was a very open and public affair. Yeah. This wasn't done in our modern day sensibilities behind closed doors with needles and, you know, electric chairs and all of those yeah. things, you know, regardless of how awful and cruel you might think modern day techniques of execution are. Yeah. This was a very public and, and scientific way to kill someone. The Romans honed crucifixion to precision, being able to keep people alive, yeah. inflicting as much pain as possible for as long as possible. Yes. They knew what they were doing. Right. They knew how long they could keep someone alive. They knew how long it took to kill someone. Yep. Um, and, and we'll actually see that on the cross as yeah. well, because when they come to the uh, the two... Uh, the two criminals who are who are one on each side of Christ, they have to break their legs to yeah. speed up their deaths. Yes, and they come to Christ and they're shocked. Yeah, because he, there's no way he should have already expired. Right. Um, and and so Christ is has grown up mm-hmm. seeing this. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is. I, I remember one of my students recently asked, like, wouldn't the knowledge of what's coming mm. somehow lessen? Mm. what he would have to face. And I, and I said, well, does the knowledge that one day you will experience the death of a mother or a father, do you think that's going to lessen mm-hmm. that reality when it comes? That's a good point. That's a good um, point. Yeah. You know, and, and so I would think in this case, it would be worse because, again, he's grown up seeing this. Yeah. He knows what's what's in it, what's involved. And actually, I would even argue, as you pointed out, Greg, that before he went to the cross, he was flogged. Yeah. That was not traditionally part of the punishment. Oh, no, no, no. I, um, I think it was the half measure um, that, that Pilate hoped would appease the crowd. Yeah. Because in John's gospel... Uh, the phrase "Behold the man," yeah, which, which has taken on—I don't mean to make that a whole separate thing—kind of a whole bit of almost folklore, uh, mm-hmm. symbolic meaning in in Catholic traditions. Mm-hmm. Um, but at its at the face of it, the when Pilate says "Behold the man," it's it's the presentation; it's the yeah. language of presentation. Look. Right, I've beaten him. I mean, near half to death. His, right, his body would have been virtually disfigured. Uh, the blood would have been just uh, indescribable, and it's, he's just a. It's almost like the Russell Crowe in Gladiator. Are you not entertained? You, Does yes. this not satisfy? Yes, your it's actually, bloodlust. Yeah, it's it's exactly like that, and it's it's you know I've always well, you you read Pilot and he he is just the consummate politician. He. Mm-hmm. He really he he doesn't care enough to do the right thing, but he's not hell bent mm-hmm. on 
just killing Jesus for the sake of killing him. Yeah. So he looks for a couple of reasonable ways he might be able to get Jesus out of this jam, but not in a way that's going to inconvenience him. Right. Which is key. He's, he's still going to, you know, so ultimately he washes his hands of it. But yeah, the, the flogging, I mean, dude, the, the physical aspects of crucifixion are themselves just so heinous. You know, this is something that looks like it was invented by the Persians, mm-hmm. perfected by the Romans. So we have centuries of, yeah. as disturbing as it is, scientific study. Yeah. They knew how to kill somebody. They knew how to do this in a, in a obviously, it was intended to be public. I mean, it's just Rome's way of flexing their muscle. You yeah. Know? And this is, children would have grown up seeing this. It was often uh, along the, the roadsides. Uh, there were times mass crucifixions, hundreds of crucifixions um, that the Romans had done for a long time when they would conquer a territory and they would they basically show this is what happens if you defy Rome. Mm-hmm. So Jesus is well aware. And generally, do, yeah, the, the breaking of legs will, will keep you from being able to inhale, exhale properly, and it just mm-hmm. speeds up your your death. The suffocation, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you would suffocate that much faster. Um, so that prospect is horrible. But still, the... The, the sin-bearing, wrath-bearing work that Jesus is going to do in the midst of something that's already horrible and unthinkable anyway. Right. The physicality of the events are, I mean, he's lost a night of sleep. Yeah. He's been bounced about like a, like a pinball from, from ruler to ruler and uh, Herod to Pilate and, you know, the, 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 everybody's getting their, 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 their jabs at him. Yeah. The soldiers are making a game of it and they... Let's crown him with a crown of thorns. Uh, let's, let's strip him, mock him, shame him. But he is going to stare the eternal justice of God mm-hmm. square in the eye and realize, yes, I must take this yeah. to save that. Talk to us about the symbolism of, of drinking the cup to the dregs. Like, what, yeah. what, what is that for listeners out there who might not know or yeah, understand yeah. what that is? Well, I, I think probably um, it, it speaks of the full satisfaction mm-hmm. of the work. When you drink it to the dregs, literally, there's not a drop left, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we use terms like that today. Oh, they, they licked the bowl. They, mm-hmm. they didn't leave a, a crumb, right? It's, it's the full, it's all taken, right? Uh, yeah. it, it's just what uh, would be done. And the implications of that work are significant. Mm-hmm. I always tie this again to Romans 8, 1. Mm-hmm. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus, no condemnation in the present. That verdict, most people think, well, that won't be pronounced till we get to the end of our life. And, you know, you know in a works uh, understanding, guy, I guess God will kind of weigh the good against the bad and hopefully, you know, tip in my favor. No, the, the verdict comes into the present now. Why? Because Jesus drank that cup to the dregs. He left it bone dry. Yeah. Um, which means he fully paid. Yeah, the price, and I think the 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 drinking that cup that that picture is. I'm not going to take a little bit of it. Mm-hmm. It it suggests that there is no more condemnation left. So the 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 theological word is propitiation. Mm. Um, the propitiation really is the full satisfaction of God's justice, mm-hmm. His wrath against sin. So there's a lot in that picture. Yeah. When he's wrestling with drinking that cup, is there any way this cup can pass from me? And of course, the fact that his father is silent, mm. Jesus knows. And then he stands up, he resolves, he's ready. Mm-hmm. He's ready to do the work. Um, and it's it's just incredible. Yeah. He is resolute, he is determined, um, and he will will do what the father has assigned him to do even experiencing a separation from him that, dude, I always say that's the part just gives me chills, even talking about it now. Yeah. I use words, I don't, I know I don't know what they mean. Yeah. And I feel like we're just at the, like we're trying to crane our necks around the corner and we see just the thinnest line of whatever that abyss is. Yeah. And that's all we can see. 
But Jesus saw it fully and how awful it was yeah. and how horrendous it was and embraced it. Well, in such such a unity, I mean, there, there are so many universal firsts, right? Yeah. I mean, never has Christ experienced separation from the Father like this. Yeah. You know, this is this is just a universal first because from before the beginning of time, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as as one, you know, just uh, how does Keller put it? The celestial dance. Yes, yes. Um, you know, just this beautiful image of perfect harmony and yeah. unity and community within the triune God and uh, to to lose that right yeah. i mean that's something that no one on no living person on any level can ever say that they've experienced because in some measure um even the the hardest atheist we were talking about this before right uh richard dawkins and yeah. uh all of the nasty things that he has to say about god yeah. God still grants him life and and you know by oh. human standards success and yeah the rain falls on him yeah the righteous and the unrighteous right health yep. food sunshine family joys all these things that are just the benevolent overflow of God's heart yeah. to all that he's created um really is a it's beautiful um but you're right it does speak that we have access mm -hmm. to that. We might call it common grace in certain circles. Yeah. So, yeah, no human being on this side of death knows what that this experience is like. Yeah. It is, by definition, unrelatable. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it really is a, a marvelous thought. Yes, yeah, so I think, dude, the garden is given a lot of attention in Scripture, mm. Because once we understand that, so to go back to your, your point about the passion film, yeah. I think Gibson was looking for a way to provide the viewer with the proper exposition. Yeah. And it's just enough. And here's what I would say. Yes, while that scene is not narrated in Scripture for us, yeah. the themes are all over yes. Scripture. The temptation in Luke 4 and Matthew 4 are just reiterated there. Yes. You can't do this. You don't want to do this. Or think about when um, Jesus told, I'm sorry, Peter told Jesus at Caesarea right. Philippi, you know, in Matthew 16 or, or Mark 8, um, you know, uh, the Son of Man must be betrayed. He's going to be yeah. uh, turned over to the hands of men. He's going to be uh, arrested. He's going to be beaten, crucified, third day rise again. And Peter says, I I'm, I'm never letting this happen to you. Stop talking about this. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. You do not have in mind, you have in mind the things of men, not the things of God. Satan, that's a very telling, does not want this mission accomplished. Yeah. So to put that scene there again is is so, I, I think, important if you're not aware of why Jesus is doing yeah. what he's doing. And then, dude, do you want to go in uh, yeah, to the so, thing? Yeah, so we know that the night goes on, as you said, Greg. Um, he, he endures six trials, three three Jewish, yep. three Roman, um, violating their own laws and customs. Yep. Um, we know that during this time, Peter is going to deny Christ and run away, basically, at the questioning of, of a 12 or 13-year-old girl. Yeah, yeah. Um, After all his bravado, uh, I'll never leave. And so we find, you know, Christ is handed over to Pilate. Pilate yep. has him flogged. Yep. That does not appease the crowd. Gives him an option, release this murderous lech Barabbas yep. or release Christ. And they choose Barabbas. Yep. Um, and so we find our way where, where Christ is eventually led to uh, what's called the skull. Yep, yep. Um, Calvary. Probably. It, most people think it looked... Yeah, there's three or four debated places mm -hmm. where that was. I don't know if we can know for certainty, but uh, it's probably called that because it looked mm -hmm. like a skull uh, in terms of its topography and you know its uh, holes, indentations, etc. Mm -hmm. And he's led out there to to be crucified. And and so we find him on the cross, and um, over the next uh, period of time, mm -hmm. the sayings that. Um, as you said, Greg, seven, six, 
maybe mm -hmm. because there's one debated. Yeah, it's uh, the first one, dude, that's debated. Um, I, I, I've not been persuaded. He didn't say this, and I'm going to make my my argument why. Actually, let me start with the second one. Okay. The second one is Luke twenty three forty three. It's his word to the uh, thief mm. or the criminal on the cross. It's interesting. Matthew's gospel tells us that they both hurled insults at him. Yeah. So if we we kind of connect the dots. Yeah. You have to ask the question: What changed? Yeah. And why does the thief say, remember me? This goes back to our first podcast, yeah. right? Um, Lord, would you remember me when you come yeah. to your kingdom? This sloppy sinner's prayer. Yeah. It's my favorite sinner's prayer because it's so unpolished. Um, just a, doesn't know what to say. Something has changed. Yeah. What in the world has changed? I think it's the first saying. Mm. Now, um, for readers that want to go to this, you can look. You'll you'll find a few articles that suggest this text. Uh, it's a textual variant issue, meaning it's not in every one of the ancient manuscripts that we have. I'm not going to do a say much more about textual criticism mm. and canon formation right now. I'll just say there are some godly people that debate this. There's godly people that defend this. Mm -hmm. I think it's be, oh, and, oh, I'm sorry. Jesus' response to the thief. I should say that is very yeah, important. Yeah. Today, this is yeah. the saying, you will be with me. Yeah. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Um, powerful. Yeah. That this guy was likely a murderer. Yeah. Uh, we can't say that for certain, but it was a capital crime. The Romans, the, the, you, you, treason would have been one of those. Mm -hmm. I think it's very likely uh, that this man uh, had murdered. Um, yeah, who knows what else. We know from his own uh, words, hey, we're getting what we deserve. Right. Uh, hey, we had a thing going for a while. We got busted. But this man has done nothing wrong. What has persuaded him? Yeah. My only evidence is the first saying uh, about nine verses sooner, Father, Jesus says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeah. And I believe that... That is something Jesus said, not just because there's some very reliable textual evidence that he did, but I also believe it because I, I think the second saying yeah. is the overflow of the first. Yeah. I mean, here is this man hurling insults, mm -hmm. you know, because the whole crowd, why not get in on it, right? You know, misery loves company. Everybody's mocking this guy. And why does the man change? Yeah. And when you see a man who has every reason to seethe and spit and curse the people that are ridiculing him and mocking him, but he doesn't just pray, he prays for their forgiveness. Yeah. He, it would be impressive if he just calmly prayed. Yeah. Right. I always tell, talk dude about the scene in to kill a mockingbird when, uh, Gregory Peck's Atticus Finch, uh, you know, the night I think he has to tell the, the Tom Robinson's widow uh, that the husband's not coming home, her husband's not coming home. And I can't remember, is it Yule, the, the redneck villain in there, uh, shows up and he, he spits in Atticus's face. And I remember, oh, man, I want Gregory Peck to just haul off and punch him right in the nose. Right? Yeah. And instead he takes his hanky and he just kind of, calmly wipes his face and he tells his children let's go home he doesn't fight. that's impressive yeah that yeah. would be impressive i always tell lisa lisa i so want to be that man yeah and she'll say i do too <laughs> meaning she wants <laughs> she wants you to be that man too because she knows it's my desire yeah i more often than not fail miserably yeah achieving it because it's a christ-like picture yeah but what Jesus does is stronger than that. Yeah. It's not just that he shows dignity. and It's not just non-retaliation. It goes, well, I think this is what grabbed the other criminal's yeah. attention. Father, forgive yeah. them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, it's interesting. If he's referring to the executioners, they know exactly what they're doing. They're very right. good at it. If he's referring to the crowds or the whole bunch, they know exactly what they're doing. Right. They, this isn't their first crucifixion. Uh, <clears throat> I think it speaks of the enormity. Yeah of the weight of what they're doing. It's 
it's definitely an intercessory prayer. Yes. Right. I mean, think you know, think about you as a father if you're watching this injustice happening to your son. Yeah. Right. And and that's almost the picture that we're getting. Right. Is yeah. you know he knows the mind of his father. Yep. And he knows that his father's heart is bent on justice. Yeah. And seeing justice done. And so this almost seems like an intercessory prayer, Father. Mm. This is what I'm here for. Yeah. Right. Um, and, Absolutely. And 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 you get that because this is what you see where where the thief that or that second criminal, sorry, not thief, but that second criminal comes in, rebuking the first. Don't you fear God? Yeah. What are you doing? There yeah. is something divine I happening agree. here. Yeah, that's a good point. Like I've caught something that you haven't caught. How could you possibly be missing this? Yeah. Right. There's something. It's going to happen too at the end with the. Roman centurion the yes. soldier says this truly must be the son of God. Something happened on the cross yeah. that he witnessed. He was there the whole time that speaks to him. By the way, a quick word on that. I, it's framed so powerfully. You see it in Mark. So I'll give something away in the Mark series. Why not give this away now? The book is really framed around, you could argue, two confessions. Mm. One in the middle in chapter eight, that's Caesarea Philippi. Yeah. Who do people say that I am? Yeah. Some say this, some say that, some yeah. say, but who do you say that I am? Peter, you're the Christ. Yeah, um, yeah he, he says it. Then, of course, he stumbles right, right. after, <laughs> but he does say it. So you've got really the, the, the leader of the apostles, the, the, what, what I think is, in the context of the book, the Jewish representative, and then you've got a, a Roman soldier, a high-ranking soldier captaining this execution squad uh, of Jesus at the end of the book. Yeah. Surely this man's the son of God. So two confessions, one Jewish, one Gentile. Yeah. This Jesus is the son. There's a lot being communicated to the reader. Um, so those first two sayings, dude, you, you see how they go hand in hand from Luke. Yeah. The third saying um, is in John. Uh, John, it's funny. We get, um, we, we, we get uh, three from Luke. We get three from John and only one from Matthew and Mark. Mm. But the John one, uh, the first of the three from John, is woman, behold your son. Yeah. Uh, and son, behold your mother. And just a beautiful moment yeah. um, that makes you think in the midst of all of this, Jesus is mindful of his mother. Mm hmm sees her standing there and notice the women stayed yeah um the men didn't other than john oh, yeah. you know john is the exception to the rule but the the women stayed and they're comforting mary she would not have been permitted to touch him mm -hmm. uh, they, they were romans so you were not uh, much for uh we'll come up and stroke the feet of your son or anything no you're, you're going to stand there and watch but i mean how her heart must have been breaking i, I can't imagine that yeah time. I, I mean, sometimes I'm so used to reading it, but I can't imagine what that was like for Mary. Yeah. And I wonder, I'm just wondering, the text doesn't say it, were some of the women with Mary, let's go. Yeah. You don't need to see this. You don't yeah. want to remember on this, but they're there. Um, she's just heartbroken. And it would have been very easy. We know now what Jesus is doing. Cosmic again. It's cosmic right. level work. Yeah. Mary's going to find out in time. He He's going to be victorious. He's going to defeat all of his enemies he's going to rise again still yeah he sees her yeah and makes provision for her um and basically here commissions john i want you to take care of my mother now what's fascinating dude is in a jewish context well that should fall to the next son down right the my only i think the implication is clear that at this time, Jesus' brothers were not believers. Yeah. So you've got the priority of saving faith in him. Yeah. Trumping the, the family connection. The yeah, the physical bloodline over the, sp the, the spiritual bloodline over the physical bloodline. Yes. Isn't yeah. that fascinating? Yeah. And it, it, the text is very clear. John takes her in. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a very special relationship that, that obviously formed. He loved her like uh, like a mother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know who knows what happened when James and and Jude, uh, some of Jesus' uh, half brothers, became believers. You know, uh, I'm sure that was a great joy mm -hmm. uh, to Mary. Uh, depending how long she lived, we don't know. But just a a beautiful word there. I love that this human yeah mom. I I see you. 
Yeah. I recognize you. And what a difficult life she must have had. Yeah. You were subjected to ridicule. People called, I mean, they thought she was a whore. Right. I mean, there's no, yeah. they thought she was just a faithless uh, woman that embarrassed uh, her young fiance Joseph yeah. and was a loose woman. All the gossip and the scandal that Jesus was a bastard child. I mean, what, what she grew up with, I'm sure, what she lived with. And she loses her husband. Yeah. Her son is now, oh. Yeah. Dude, it just, it crushes me every time I think about it. Yeah. That he was that tender towards her. Yeah. Um, and then we cover the fourth one. Yep. Uh, when I say covered it. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and then there's that easy one. Right. It's interesting, though, the the detail I haven't said yet is this is the this is when the sky grows dark. Yes. And darkness, no surprise, symbol of God's judgment. Yeah. Just do a Bible concordance search, and uh, you will find it's all there. Yeah. Darkness and judgment. It makes sense. Go hand in hand, and I believe it's because this is the what one writer calls the crucifixion within the crucifixion. Yeah. The 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 cry of abandonment. Yeah. You know, that he has been um, forsaken. Yeah. And then, uh, dude, how are we doing on time? Good. Good, because I just want to uh, be mindful. Uh, the uh, fifth saying is uh, just very, again, another very human touch. Mm -hmm. I thirst. Yeah. John nineteen twenty eight. Yeah. And that's something. I am thirsty. And uh, I remember when I did a series on the seven sayings years ago, I struggled with this one a little bit. I, I'll say this. I swear I, I push back a little bit on Spurgeon. And mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, because, you know, I know so much more than than he did um uh, it seems really foolish to say that it's sort of like uh you know uh somebody saying yeah i'm uh, i think i play ball a little bit better than michael jordan did um, <laughs> better swimmer than michael phelps better football player than ray lewis um but he in his sermon on this text said a lot of true things mm -hmm. jesus thirst for righteousness his thirst to do the father's will for whatever reason, um, I think John says to fulfill the scripture, um, and th that's th that's a whole a whole separate issue. Why the fulfillment of scriptures matters? I'm going to save that yep. uh, for time's sake because I'll go on a long tangent there. But um, I think it's just a picture of his humanness. Yeah, he's intolerably thirsty. Yeah, I think it also helps to see that he will not take. Earlier, when it's offered to him, the myrrh, yeah, that's that's uh, w would have deadened his pain. Mm -hmm. Doesn't take it. Uh, it. Would have acted as an analgesic of sorts. Uh, just John, sort of reminding us of uh, the fact that he is doing this as yeah. a man representing men. Well, and it I, it physically makes sense in his humanity. Yes. right? I mean, how much. How much blood he has lost? Oh, of course. Um, oh, he's, due to all of this, dehydrated. And, yeah, uh, uh, on st times a million. Yeah, and so just getting that, getting that detail of a reminder, right? We we see his his compassion and his humanity. Now we're seeing his physical humanity being brought forth. Now, yeah. right, the the needs of his physical body. Yes, um, as a human. Oh, absolutely, um, and I think it's. John does that. Uh, John, it's interesting because John is the gospel writer we think of reminding us of his deity, and he certainly does. Mm -hmm. He's the one who tells us, right in the, front, right? in the beginning was the Word, the Word right. was with God, and the Word was God. And then he also ends the book with Thomas's confession, or almost ends it in, in near the very end, um, where you've got Thomas saying, my Lord and my God. So he kind of takes us back after we've read this. Oh, that's right. This is God in the flesh. But he's also the one who tells us in John 4, mm -hmm. the story of the woman at the well, that Jesus sitting down because he was wearied from his journey. Yeah. You know, just, just those little, oh, yeah, he was tired, physically bone tired. Yeah. And here he is thirsty uh, at the end. He is experiencing the full extent of human suffering. Um, and then, dude, I, I, I don't want to say any of these are my favorite, but, boy, this, this could be a whole podcast just on John 1930. Uh, to telestai, mm. it is 
finished. Not I am finished. Yeah. The work. Yeah. The mission. Woo. I mean, you think of, again, back in the garden. Yep. Right? You think of, is there any way possible to remove this cup? Mm -hmm. You've got the darkness coming, the crucifixion within the crucifixion, that, that experience of abandonment. We sing it when uh, how deep the father's love, yeah. how deep the pain of searing loss, the father turns his face away. Yeah. Um, just really incredible. And him saying, it is done. Yeah. I have done. Think of the implications, dude. Yeah. He's not our co-pilot. He doesn't start it and we finish it. Yeah. He says it's finished before you and I were ever born. Right. Yeah. It's- well, and that's and that's where we get to this cosmic encounter, right? Because yeah. this is... This is all of humanity, the weight of humanity on Christ, past, present, and yes. future. And future. And it all, you know, we, when we talk about God working outside of times, I mean, this is one of those moments where while the cross was a moment in time, its effects were timeless. Yes. And it, it, it funnels all of time and all of history funnels into this one event. Why was Abraham saved, dude? Because yeah. Jesus died on the cross. Well, that hadn't happened yet. It doesn't matter. Right. Abraham has what we would call forward-looking faith. He yes. sees into the, the darkness. He sees dim light a little bit. Yeah. There's something about that God's going to do. It's a, I have to trust him. Yeah. Well, we, we are seeing what he's going to do. Yeah. And he, Genesis 15, Abraham believes and God credits it as yes. righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. Why do you and I, why are we forgiven? Because yeah. we look back, back. Yeah. and we do see more clearly. It's the benefit of living on the side of, of, of the New Testament. Yep. But we see the sick Christ lays his life down. He pays the penalty for our sins. He absorbs God's righteous wrath and, and justice for our sins so we don't have to. And we're saved by that backward looking faith. Uh, you're right, timeless. Dude, this is the mission, grand scale, and I always love to to hit this one because if you meet somebody struggling, I'm not I'm just not doing well this week with the Lord. I so I understand, I understand. And I'm not sure, you know, if I'm gonna go to heaven and it's, well, I'm sure mm-hmm. because he didn't ask you to finish it. Right. He's finished it. He already yeah. announced that. He did all that is necessary for us. Uh, and then the last saying, dude, Luke, we're back to Luke, Luke twenty three, forty six. Beautiful little moment. It's it's it. My sense is he said these back to back. It is finished because mm-hmm. John says it is finished, and he bowed his head and died. Luke says, "Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit." I yeah. think this is probably the order. It is finished. Yeah, Father, yeah. into your hands I commit my spirit. It's interesting the times that Jesus mentioned the hands of men. Mm. Uh, the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men. Yeah, and what did we do? Well, we 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 spit upon him. We tore his beard. We. We we dressed him in a in, in in a faux robe and mocked him and hated him and and uh, all for our pride and entertainment and uh, you know that's what that's what man's hands right. did with him but never again would Jesus experience that yeah. Father now into your hands I commend my spirit which kind of leaves us so what are the Father's hands going to do mm. with him. I got a pretty good idea. It's going to be pretty good. Yeah, uh, and I think Easter Sunday will ultimately answer that. Now yes. that he's he's innocent, Father, I'm coming back. Yeah, I've completed the mission you sent me. It's uh, just a good thing for us to ponder. Yeah, this uh, heading into Holy Week. Yeah, no, and you know we have our normal. Uh, ending sign off that we don't do occasionally and this, and this is, one is one of the one times of that yep. we are not I knew you were going to say that Nathan um, and so, rightly so uh, yeah you, just again the whole purpose of why we were doing this is for us to think about contemplate to prepare our hearts um, for Easter, it is always good. Um, you know, Scripture talks about meditation. Scripture talks about reflections. Um, God is showing His people all throughout. Remember, remember, remember. Do these things so that you can remember um, the work that God has done and is doing on our behalf. And yes. so, we wanted to bring those things to your mind as well uh, during this time. And we look forward. Uh, as we do on on Good Friday, we always leave on a, a more contemplative and heavier note. 
because that's what it deserves. Yes. You know, this, as you said, right, the, the, the Roman, the soldier looking at Christ, mm. surely this man was the son of God. Yeah. Um, and so we leave you to contemplate uh, whenever you're listening to this, um, and we look forward to celebrating on the other side. Mm. Yes. So we will catch you all next time. Thank you again for listening to These Go to 11, an unchurchy conversation about everyday faith. Once again, please make sure you like, subscribe, and review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you ever find yourself in the Forest Hill, Maryland area, please feel free to stop by at 135 Industry Lane, and you can get all of our service times and information at ChristFC.org. These Go to 11.